Hey, what's up? Christian here, and this is Orbiter. Some of my subscribers may have picked this up at this point, but I think you need to make the world you want to live in. That's why my life's ambition is to help create a type one civilization, which is basically a society that has complete control over all the energy systems on the planet. In this video, I'm gonna show you my thoughts on how we could make this happen sooner. So if you like the idea of leveling up Earth, this video might just be for you. Also, if you share my interest in creating a more advanced world, subscribe to the channel to keep up with all my future projects. But without further ado, let me give you my two cents on how we could upgrade civilization. Our world is facing a crisis like it's never seen before. Human behavior is causing changes on Earth that would normally take thousands of years to occur. Poverty is rampant, and many people feel pessimistic about the future. I think there are many reasons for why this happens, but using a common engineering technique called first principles, I've concluded the origin of these challenges may come from the lack of abundant renewable energy. Everything we consume requires energy meaning that it's a fixed cost of life that's included in every product and service. If we had access to cheap, renewable energy, this would dramatically impact mega projects, automation, and for us, it would decrease the price of everything we buy. I'll be touching on energy generation throughout the video, but in order to create a type one civilization with the world in its current state, other initiatives need to begin in the right order. Starting off this list with the elephant in the room. No matter how fast we decarbonize our energy systems with renewable energy, it won't be fast enough. Although introducing those technologies should be fast-tracked, we have to acknowledge that the greenhouse gases produced over the last century are still there and pose an enormous risk of something called the runaway greenhouse effect. This is where the warming effects are compounded over time, like in the Arctic where permafrost stores methane inside of the ice, but as the climate warms, it will melt the ice and rapidly release even more gases that heat up the planet. The best example we have for this happening is the planet Venus, but Earth is unlikely to get that bad, according to researchers from NASA. A separate natural disaster in combination might put us over the top like it has in the past though. Also to be clear, this isn't a defeatist perspective. It's just history indicates that extinctions are common on this planet and we need to be prepared for that. This is why the IPCC, the largest intergovernmental panel for climate change, has stated that we have less than 10 years to get our acts together. CO2 takes hundreds of years to break down. So waiting and hoping isn't going to cut it, but surprisingly planting trees may give us the time needed to make that transition. A recent Yale study indicates that we could eliminate the last decade of carbon emissions if we planted 1.2 trillion trees on Earth today. Plus, having more trees in the ground helps in preventing floods and the reduction of droughts. So this is a multi-pronged approach. Currently, countries are engaging in large-scale planting efforts, but due to the urgency of this issue, it needs to be sped up rapidly, or else countless other issues on Earth may become harder to solve. Another reality humanity needs to come to terms with is that sea levels are likely to rise. And this is a huge challenge because half of all of humanity lives on the coast. We know that extreme weather events have increased in frequency over the decades. And the most common strategy has been to hope and pray it hits someone else's land. Researchers have models showing which land is most at risk and implementing preventative measures is likely to save many more lives and more money compared to doing nothing. The biggest issue here is that many cultures conflate land with identity. So telling them that they need to leave before the crisis occurs is going to be a really tough sell. This is why adapting to the changes on our planet is necessary if we plan to become a type one civilization. So optimizing communities to withstand strong storms and higher sea levels needs to begin now. Introducing seawalls to at-risk areas may help to repel waves, but increasing the elevation of buildings and fully waterproofing building materials may be our best chance at reducing the flow of climate refugees. Planting trees like mangroves can also help in the security 
of coastal regions because they are among the best species for absorbing CO2 and they would help to prevent erosion along the coast. This is an important priority because if people can no longer thrive on the land they live on, then social unrest and mass migration are sure to increase over time. Speaking of climate refugees, the most likely trigger for these mass migrations is going to be the inability to grow food. We know this because this is already occurring in various parts of the world today. Food is a fundamental type of energy, and our food systems are innately weak for two main reasons. One, the success of a crop is relative to how predictable the weather is. And two, we feed the majority of crops to the other animals we eat. Excluding the massive carbon footprint of animal agriculture, the biggest problem there is actually the methane and nitrous oxide emissions, since they warm the planet much faster than the stuff that comes from fossil fuels. Despite the fact that methane heats the world over 25 times more than CO2, it does have the benefit of breaking down within only a couple years. Since time is of the essence to prevent the runaway greenhouse effect, I propose redirecting all government subsidies toward more sustainable food options, specifically fruits and vegetables. Retaining people's freedom to eat what they want should be maintained though. But if an industry is harming the planet and isn't profitable without subsidies, it should be trimmed from government budgets. Since animal agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation, a decrease in the consumption would give a huge boost to my first proposal. Localizing food supply chains with indoor grow operations should also be strategically developed in places people consume the most food, like big cities. Indoor growing allows for complete climate control and often saves up to 90% more water than traditional methods. That's a big deal because in the case of the US, 80% of our water is used for agriculture and the majority of that water is used for animal agriculture. As far as staple crops go like corn, wheat, rice, and soy, the technology doesn't exist yet to cultivate those within grow houses at scale. So genetically modifying heat and drought resistant versions may be needed in the future. Now this next proposal is one I speak about a lot in my other videos, and it deals with upgrading the grid so that it helps to complement renewable energy and the future energy sharing economy. For more info on that, I've attached a card in the top right of the video that will link you to a video about that. Electrical grids across the world happen to be some of the largest machines ever built. And unfortunately, they were built for the use of fossil fuels. Because of that, electrical grids are not compatible with renewable energy and can occasionally cause even more inefficiencies than if we just used fossil fuels. This is primarily because we lack the ability to store large amounts of energy. Fossil fuels energy is stored within the organic matter we burn, right? But renewables require a battery in most cases. In the last couple of years, Tesla has been leading the world in grid scale battery deployment as seen in the recent Australian blackouts and in California just last year. The faster governments and companies deploy these grid-scale batteries, the faster we're going to see installations of solar farms and wind turbines, which would be great. It's also worth pointing out that a system is only as good as its whole, and I think we need to consider the benefits of a unified global grid in order to take advantage of all the energy on the planet. And yes, you heard that right as in neighboring countries combining the benefits of their location on Earth to create a more versatile grid. Your first thought may be that sharing any kind of system with a foreign country could be dangerous, and you might be right. But I believe the benefits far outweigh the risks in this case. Interoperable grids are crucial for consistent renewable energy because it is innately inconsistent if you look at one region at least. But if you were to zoom out across time zones, there is consistently strong wind and sunlight somewhere. The biggest problem here, aside from the politics, go figure, is the transmission of the energy because the further energy travels, the more you lose. So as technologies like carbon nanotubes or other future conductive materials are discovered, that endeavor could become more feasible. 
We have more than enough energy on Earth. All we need to do is get better at transporting it to where it's needed. So I'm sure we've all heard of Bitcoin, right? Well, let's just focus on the technology that makes it work, blockchain. Although there are many different kinds, the general takeaway should be that blockchain is a really efficient way of tracking and verifying information. Assuming cryptocurrencies continue to rise in utility, it's likely they could be used to digitize physical things in real life. So think of it as having a unique QR code for each product that makes up the final product. This would offer increased transparency into the supply chain of raw materials, because on a blockchain, transactions are public. Rare metals, diamonds, oil, and illegally logged lumber, all these finite resources are not tracked as well as they could be. This is dangerous for the future of humanity because populations are expected to grow to 10 billion by 2050. And if we don't know what we have in the pantry, it'll only become easier to drain resources at an unsustainable rate. Speaking of food storage, this level of transparency could help establish something called an environmental impact score, similar to the nutrition label on the back of your food. The data collected from blockchains could help determine the emissions and water consumption of every product, so we could be more informed and consume with our values in mind. Blockchains also provide rapid real-time updates, so using public information available Powerful predictive algorithms could be developed to reduce emissions and increase the speed of shipments. The way I see it is the best way to manage a problem is to measure the problem. And blockchains may be up to the challenge within a decade, according to some industry leaders. All right, so this one gets a bad rap, but we can't have a discussion about optimizing civilization without talking about nuclear energy. Objectively speaking, it's the most efficient, most sustainable energy source on Earth right now. Plus, the workplace death toll in that industry is significantly lower than in fossil fuels. None of this will change the minds of some, and understandably so. But I'm not here to discuss what is, but what could be. Thorium nuclear reactors are a real possibility in the coming decades, and we should begin making plans to build them instead. The primary benefits of thorium power is that it produces only a fraction of the nuclear waste compared to uranium power plants. The chances of nuclear meltdowns are also significantly lower. And you can't build world-ending bombs with it, which would be nice. Nuclear of all kinds should be considered though, because the faster we can solve our energy needs, the faster humanity can reduce scarcity and modernize economies. So far, I've made a point of proposing initiatives that are feasible right now or in the near future. But the reality is to become a type one civilization, this likely won't occur for at least the next 100 years. Thankfully, we have already reached a 0.7 on the Kardashev scale. You know, the thing that measures what a type one civilization actually is. This means lots of progression has already occurred, but over this stretch of time, many technologies and events I can't predict are likely to occur. One thing's for sure, Earth has many forms of energy generation that we'll eventually harness. It's just a matter of using the right kind of energy for the right people. This will become more clear over time as costs come down and countries double down on the benefits of renewable energy. The goal over the next 100 years should be to have energy coming from every source possible and decentralize the production. Currently, only a handful of countries on Earth control the energy supply, mostly being fossil fuels. And I think we should empower each person to become their own power company by selling excess renewable energy back into the grid until energy eventually becomes completely free. After all, if you can have energy generating technology built with renewable technology, that means the entire production process in future generation is renewable, and that's what we should aspire for. Every part of Earth offers opportunity for energy generation, which is why harnessing energy from the ocean, geothermal, or even the energy from objects in motion are all real potentials. Also, despite some moderate success on the experimental scale, fusion energy 
may be available within the next hundred years or more. And if that happens, it is literally game over for energy scarcity. This would mean that humans have complete control over a mini sun, and it would ensure that no matter the population size or crazy mega project in development, it would become significantly easier to manage. So we finally made it to the end, and I really hope these crises I've discussed today don't make you feel down, because they really shouldn't. And in fact, there are no problems. There's really only solutions. And we have an opportunity right now to make the world we want to live in. The challenges I've brought up are proportionally relevant to every human on Earth, and I think our conversations should represent more of the things that impact us the most. So let me know down in the comment section what you think of the ideas I've proposed, or if you think I've just missed something. Until the next one, thank you fellow orbiters, and remember, there is no guarantees for the future, especially if we don't plan for it.